In the last decade, rapid advances in aircraft development have pushed the speeds of airplanes near the supersonic range. The F-51 travels 475 miles per hour. The FJ-1 over 550 miles per hour. And an operational Air Force F-86 set a world speed record at 670 miles per hour. In addition to the tests necessary for the development of high-speed airplanes, present-day guided missiles require testing at supersonic velocities. For this reason, North American Aviation foresaw the need for a large supersonic wind tunnel to continue development of supersonic airplanes and rockets. North American supersonic tunnel was engineered along the basic lines of a tunnel at Kokel, Germany. It consists of four major buildings, the air storage tank, the test building, the vacuum chamber, and the pump building. The tunnel provides a 16-inch square working section making it one of the largest tunnels in the country. Hundreds of drawings and blueprints were used in the completed design. The air storage chamber was the first unit to be constructed. This chamber provides 22,500 cubic feet of storage space for dried air at atmospheric pressure. The tank shell is constructed of preformed one quarter inch steel plate which were electrically welded to form a structure 34 feet in diameter and 48 feet high. Dry air is stored in the chamber between large nylon membranes, which were fabricated and tested at the Goodyear Rubber Company plant in Akron, Ohio. Two membrane sections are used, one to form the base of the chamber and the other for the top. The upper membrane rises as the dried air is put in under it and then falls as the air is removed when the tunnel runs. This keeps the air entering the tunnel at atmospheric pressure at all times. The large nylon membrane for the top of the chamber is attached around the interior of the tank at a point 25 feet above the ground. The next phase of construction was the erection of the giant sphere, which provides 36,000 cubic feet of vacuum to draw the dried air through the test section. Construction was handled in a unique and efficient manner. The center ring of the chamber was prefabricated and raised into position with mobile cranes. This ring was placed on large rollers so that the entire chamber could be rotated during the welding operation. The hemispherical ends of the chamber are constructed of preformed three-quarter inch steel plate. No internal bracing is necessary, although the shell must withstand a total external load of 12 million pounds. Workers outside and inside of the chamber completed welding of the seams. To facilitate proper welding, the chamber was rotated at intervals by the rollers. During tunnel operation at high air speeds, this chamber will be pumped down to a 99% vacuum by large rotary vane vacuum pumps. This vacuum is maintained until a run is started and the air from the air storage tank is allowed to rush into the vacuum. Between each run, the chamber is evacuated for the next run. The test building and the pump building are of the Quonset type. 600 kilowatts of power sufficient to run the vacuum pumps, air dryers, and instrumentation units had to be provided. In July 1948, the major units of the supersonic tunnel were completed. The heart of the project is in the test building, which houses workshops and offices in addition to the tunnel components. Inside of the test building, one of the units in the tunnel stream is the quick-acting vacuum chamber gate valve, which controls the airflow. The gate moves up and down on roller bearings and is actuated by a pneumatic cylinder. Only eight-tenths of a second is required for gate operation. The next unit is the variable diffuser, this section permits a change in the size of the air passage, which provides more efficient pressure recovery and allows longer test runs. The plates of the diffuser can be varied to change the throat size. The first unit near the air storage chamber is the working section, which houses the model during the run. The test model is mounted on a sting or thin support so that there is little interference with the airstream. 
The test section contains nozzle blocks, which serve to accelerate the airflow. The glass ports are 17 and one half inches in diameter and one and one quarter inches thick. The working section is composed of a number of steel plates, which were carefully welded and accurately machined to close tolerances. Each component of the tunnel had to be fabricated to close tolerances to permit proper airflow. Machining of the test section parts had to be performed with meticulous care. After machining, the parts were closely inspected. The assembled units of the tunnel were installed as they were completed. In addition, each section had to be tested. When the tunnel is in operation, the air flows from right to left, as seen from this position. During a preliminary checkout of the vacuum chamber in this gate valve, a very interesting phenomenon took place. Here we are looking into the chamber duct, and you see the relatively damp air rushing into the evacuated vacuum sphere at such a high rate that a shockwave pattern is formed by the condensation of the air. The Laval nozzle blocks are constructed of selected hardwood and shaped to aerodynamic contours. The nozzle blocks determine the velocity of the air. The air is contracted and accelerated as it passes over the contour of the blocks. The blocks are interchangeable. This set provides a Mach number of 1.22. This set, a Mach number of 2.48. Mach number 3.4, Mach number 4.4, and the maximum speed, Mach number 5.3, equivalent to 4,000 miles per hour. Three types of automatic recording equipment are used during tunnel operation. This manometer registers static pressures in the airstream. The second type of automatic recording equipment is a newly developed six-component strain gauge balance system which is inserted inside of the test model. This internal balance system provides accurate measurement of forces and moments acting on the model. In actual operation, the balance system is placed inside the model and forces are measured by sensitive strain gauges. These forces are indicated by a meter and translated by Speedomax recorders. Roll force is measured by sensitive components of the balance system and recorded in a similar manner. The third type of instrumentation used during tunnel operation is the Schlieren optical system. This system permits visual and photographic observation of shockwave patterns during the run. Before the start of an actual tunnel run, the Schlieren optical system is moved into position. The complete system is mounted on a 30-inch tube which travels on a track. The Schlieren system permits a qualitative analysis of the changes in density of the airflow caused by pressure and temperature gradients in the shock waves. In operation, the point light source throws a beam of light into the parabolic mirror. From the mirror, the beam goes through the test section where the model is located, and then is directed by a second parabolic mirror to the camera. The light source, shown here, contains a mercury vapor lamp emitting a light equivalent to 5100 candle power. The light source furnishes a steady light for observation, or a flash of four millionths of a second for photographic work. The technician is adjusting the knife edges, which determine the sensitivity of the system. After the knife edges are adjusted, the light beam is focused in this 20-inch parabolic mirror, which throws a parallel light beam through the test section. The parallel light rays are refracted proportionately to the stream density, and this refracted light is then focused by a second parabolic mirror through another set of knife edges into the camera or to a screen for visual or photographic observation. Models of missiles or supersonic airplanes to be tested in the tunnel are turned from solid bar stock. 
These models are extremely accurate facsimiles of the contemplated design and are sometimes equipped with movable control surfaces if the tests require them. These missile models are inspected to an accuracy of two ten thousandths of an inch. The model, complete with internal balance system, is placed in the model support. The test section doors are closed and then aligned with the hand screws. The glass ports will permit visual and Schlieren observation of the model. Two commercial air dryers dry the air which is used in the air storage chamber. The air must be dried to a dew point of minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent the formation of condensation shock waves or fog when the air passes through the test section. The air is supplied at a rate of 3600 cubic feet per minute through the dryers to the air storage chamber. As the air enters under the large nylon membrane, the section is slowly raised to the top of the chamber. The chamber now contains 22,500 cubic feet of dried air. The large vacuum pumps are driven by two 200 horsepower synchronous motors. It takes 37 and one half minutes to completely evacuate the chamber, but the average evacuation time between runs is only eight minutes. The heat exchanger controls the temperature of the water-cooled vacuum pumps. The rate of sight gauge must show water flow before the first vacuum pump can be started. As the big pumps start pulling a vacuum, the air is removed from the vacuum chamber until there is a 99% vacuum and a force of 12 million pounds is acting on the outside of the chamber. After the dry air storage chamber is filled and the vacuum chamber is evacuated, final preparations are made for a run. Here the engineer is loading the Speedomax recorders. The Schlieren optical system is prepared for operation and the camera is focused. The plates of the variable diffuser are set to the calculated level. The vacuum chamber gate valve, which starts and stops the airstream, is ready for action. Just before starting, the engineer checks all components of the tunnel and then presses the button which opens the gate valve. system presents this view of the shock wave. As the Mach number increases to a point beyond the transonic range, the first compression shock appears and is clearly visible. The shock waves appear at the nose, wing, and tail of the model the instant supersonic flow is attained. At higher Mach numbers, the waves are closer to the surfaces of the model. The technician now presses the button to take the Schlieren picture. During the run, the nylon membrane drops as the air flows through the tunnel. The completed Schlieren photograph of the model is analyzed in detail to check air flow. This picture shows the shockwave pattern on a conical body at a speed equivalent to 1,500 miles per hour. The shock waves are going off the point of the body, and the curved lines show the conical shock waves originating at the point of the body as they intersect the window on the sidewall of the tunnel. Shock waves are also going off the base of the body. From this information, the designer of the missile airframe can determine the merits of the airframe contour. And, as you can see from the airflow action, 
He can evaluate the design to determine what effect the shock waves will have on the missile in flight. With aerodynamic information readily available through the use of the supersonic wind tunnel, the job of designing and fabricating large rockets or missiles assumes a parallel position to the design of long-range airplanes. <laughs> 